Hi, this is Michael Laster with Ability Fierce. And today we have on a very special guest, Mary Somoza. Mary Somoza is the queen of advocates. She is the most uh, connected, hooked up advocate that I've ever met. She knows everything. And that's why this is going to be a very special show because this show is where we're going to get to pick her brains and learn stuff that, that only she knows. So let's do the TV magic and say, Hi, Mary. It's good to see nice you. To Thank you for coming to Ability Fierce. Uh, we're very fierce here, you know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the way you need to be to be an advocate. Right, exactly. And one of the things I admire about you is that you, um, you've really got the advocate game down. Like, I noticed you took that course that they were mentioning. Um, Partners in Policy Making. Partners in Policy. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was the first time they had ever done it, and uh, my children were about five years old. They are now 35, so this is a while back. And they chose 50 parents from across the state who were already raising hell mm -hmm. on local levels. And they brought us to Al Al Albany for about, I think it was six weeks, perhaps maybe a month, on a Friday afternoon, and we would spend the whole rest of the until 10 o'clock at night mm -hmm. on Friday and then up at 8 in the morning we would start at 8 and all the way through till 4 in the afternoon and they taught us it had to educate policymakers more uh, to make your advocacy more effective mm -hmm. tricks and tools of when you're talking to a policymaker how sometimes you cannot actually get to the representative, the elected official, mm -hmm. but chiefs of staff have the ears and often recommend and finesse the way to the actual assembly person or senator or whoever it is you're, you're wanting to speak to. And the second thing they taught us is not to be afraid mm -hmm. that our personal stories, our life stories of what we were going through with our children was the most effective tool that we, we could use, not any fancy knowing the law. We're not expected to know all of that stuff, although we end up knowing it better than most. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but tools that, that you can convince in 10 minutes a lawmaker that your case is valid and that they should take it up and they should, you know, uh, assist you and work with you and you hope to move their position. And then uh, they, they introduced us to people in management and budget, people in government, mm -hmm. in different parts of government, in the different sessions, so they could explain what their uh, job was and how our advocacy could affect their jobs and the intricacies, if you will, of how a law becomes a law and uh, what you can do and how you can do grassroots movements. It was, it was for us who were out there already doing that, mm -hmm. but not really knowing what we were doing, just mm -hmm. gut feeling and doing the best we could. It was a terrific eye-opener. My, my daughter is identical twins, mm -hmm. uh, Alba and Anastasia, and while they're identical, they don't physically look alike anymore because of the level of disability, and, uh, but they are definitely identical twins. Mm -hmm. And um, both of them are different, different characters and have different uh, likes and dislikes. Alba is the artist, and she, right now, she attends, she goes to a, an art studio in Chelsea where that's for uh, artists with developmental disabilities of all different ages and backgrounds. And they paint and, and or sculpt or whatever their medium is. And they have art shows and they go to outsider art events and, and in museums and the Metropolitan Museum. They, Alva does tours there for students with disabilities. So she has her whole, whole art work, and she sells her paintings, mm -hmm. and she sells them very well. And on Fridays, she teaches at a art, she is the art teacher at a school called I Hope in Harlem. Mm -hmm. 
and all of the students are nonverbal. All of them, they're either med medically fragile or with significant disabilities, but all of them are nonverbal. And their teacher is also nonverbal mm -hmm. and communicates through her communication device and gives instruction to the aides. Oh, this is amazing. How to she works on the curriculum mm -hmm. and beforehand, and then she works with the, the teachers in the school and they decide what, the, the, what they will work on for the rest of the semester. They get the materials, they line up the materials for the students, and then she teaches the class mm -hmm. and gives instructions to the aides what they have to do, don't do the work for, let, let the child choose the color. And Alba does all these instructions for the aides as well as the child, because she knows that in a lot of cases when she was growing up, nobody gave her a chance to choose. Mm -hmm. With Anastasia, uh, Alba, when college came around, uh, because of her severity of her disability, uh, she has 132 IQ, mm -hmm. but she couldn't do college level work, the writing and the, the, yeah. the pressure, but she audited classes at mm -hmm. Queen's College. Mm -hmm. Anastasia, uh, both of them were... Why Queen's College? because they had a program there. Okay. Queen's College and Brooklyn College mm -hmm. had programs to integrate um, students with significant disabilities through District 75 mm -hmm. into auditing classes and being on campus. So while it was not going to college really, mm -hmm. it was the whole college experience. They hung out on campus with mm -hmm. kids and they got as close to possible the college experience mm -hmm. and Anastasia uh, was had always been very interested in uh, advocacy and, po and politics because mm -hmm. she was the one from when she was nine years old she was the one who asked the question to the president of the United States mm -hmm. that she was advocating for her twin mm -hmm. because her twin was in special ed and she said I believe Alba should be in a regular class just like me. Mm -hmm. So she already started at nine. She went to advanced placement courses at Yale for, for high school students during the summer mm -hmm. and constitutional law, uh, uh, communications and the law and got A's in everything. And Yale, incidentally, they took down doors and modified everything, moved classrooms so she could do the summer classes and then she applied to about 10 schools 10 mm -hmm. colleges and I have to say something and I hope parents who are listening to this take note but sadly Anastasia and Alba went to public school and the counselors were recommending not just to her mm -hmm. but to all of the students not to apply to the big schools to the Harvards and the Yales and the Ivy League mm -hmm. not to apply mm -hmm. because they wouldn't stand a chance. And when the counselor saw all Anastasia's applications, she tried to discourage Anastasia from applying. Mm -hmm. I had to go in <laughs> and speak to the counselor. But it doesn't and cost say, anything. Unless it does cost a little bit to apply. But it no, but you, you, yeah. you can get the fees waived. Right. Exactly. If you're low income, you can get the fees waived. And I said, please don't do that. I said, please don't encourage children not to apply. I said, you know, yes, have safety schools, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. So Anastasia applied. She was interviewed twice for Harvard. Mm -hmm. And she got accepted to Georgetown amongst about five other top schools. And because Georgetown had such a terrific um, uh, government program, uh, political science, uh, she chose Georgetown. And she, it took her five years instead of four, mm -hmm. but she graduated with a degree in government with a wonderful experience there, made friends with the professors who she has kept to this day, and school friends as well and the big alumni association with Georgetown. It's when photographer Amy Berg learned she had retinitis pigmentosa, 
a degenerative disease that leads to blindness, she thought it might be time to try something new. It's almost like there's a stigma attached to you if, if you're disabled. So um, I decided I had to change my career and I had to be an entrepreneur of some sort because I wouldn't fire myself. Soon, Amy's Cookies grew to employ seven people with over a half a million dollars in sales. And that has made Berg one of the rare small business owners who is also blind. I set up Amy's Cookies so I could be independent. And it worked for 28 years. Now, just when she was looking to sell her business and retire, she's encountered an unforeseen setback. But now I'm having to close my business because Dean and DeLuca owes me a tremendous amount of money, $71,000, and they're not paying. Berg's problem started when Dean and DeLuca, a traditional New York gourmet shop, was purchased by a Thai real estate mogul with plans to turn the brand global. But she says the new owner neglects the flagship location, which became a culinary landmark shortly after opening in 1977. I mean, it's kind of ironic that I'm being forced to close by the company that kind of put me on the map. Berg reached out to Giorgio De Luca for help after reading an article saying he had kept a stake in the company. He had sold off his shares years ago. He didn't have a stake in it, and he wanted to know um, how that information got into that article because he wasn't very happy about it because he didn't want to be associated with these people and how they're kind of ruining, you know, his baby. And he and then and then he advised me to get a lawyer. Berg isn't the only vendor who's been stiffed, but she says her disability will make it that much harder to find buyers who could take the place of her main customer. I'd have to hire somebody to go out and, and get more accounts. That would be fine if I had the money in my account from Dean and DeLuca to hold me over until, you know, I was able to do that. So she got her degree there, then uh, she was uh, volunteering at the Clinton Foundation up in Harlem, mm -hmm. and she through the foundation, she met a lot of very important people. And at one of these events, she met Cherie Blair, mm -hmm. uh, Tony Blair's wife. And she said she asked Anastasia what she was planning. And she says, well, I'm going to do my master's. And uh, she says, why don't you come to London and do your master's, get a more global view, do it in London. Mm -hmm. And so Anastasia went to the London School of Economics and Political Science to get a master's degree in human rights. How is it, London for disabled people? It's fantastic. Yeah, is it better it, than New York? Well, it's, it's oh yes, yes, mm -hmm. it, 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 is, it, it is better than New York. But what was interesting was her room in the graduate school mm -hmm. uh, was not, it, it, was a dis, it looked like a disabled room with the wide doors and everything, but she couldn't open the doors. Mm -hmm. And there were a whole series of things which had there been a fire or anything. And it came to force because she had a very disagreeable incident with, a, with an aide. Mm -hmm. And she was pretty much held hostage for two days in her room and she couldn't get out because she couldn't open the door. Yeah. You see this, these little tiny... Little details. ...become disasters, yeah. But no bad thing goes without turning it into an advocacy moment. Mm -hmm. And so Cherie Blair came to the school. She was on the board of governors. She met with the whole hierarchy of the school and told them that something really terrible could have happened to Anastasia because her room was not really accessible. Well, something really terrible did happen to Anastasia, didn't it? it well, something, she had to defer that semester because it was so traumatizing. And she just uh, she just needed to to defer that semester and come back. But in that time, they, they made they on every stuff. floor of the graduate they made access really accessible, state of the art, mm -hmm. 150 thousand pounds of uh, reorganizing the accessible rooms. She's working mm -hmm. only part time until we can figure out all the dynamics of how do you keep your medical insurance, your Medicaid, and the job. And apparently there's a way, we haven't figured it out yet, but we're working on it. But she's working part-time, three days a week, with, for the Speaker of the City Council of New York. Okay. 
and it's the first time in the history of the City Council that they've had a, a disability coordinator for the whole council. Mm -hmm. So she's working with other council members as well uh, on disability issues. And just her physical presence there mm -hmm. in the in the council, the people see her, they're in the elevator with her. They, it, it was the same when she, she did an internship in the Senate mm -hmm. with then Senator Clinton. Mm -hmm. The importance were those uh, members of Congress and the Senate seeing her, going around, being with her in the elevator, etc., etc. It's having people with disabilities in visible positions uh, out there where you can see, oh, here's a very qualified person who happens to be using a wheelchair. Well, that's why also when Anastasia spoke at the, um, at the convention in, in 2016, mm -hmm. Uh, for Hillary, for president, that was a very important moment for our community because she, on the label behind, was advocate for people with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, she had photos with Hillary since she was nine years old. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm a new friend of Hillary's and because... So you're pulling me out just for this, yeah. For, exactly, just because Trump uh, made fun of a disabled reporter, mm -hmm. and so they're putting me in there to counteract that. Well, this is one of the things that Anastasia also said in her speech, and if I may tell a little secret, I insisted <laughs> that she put in the speech, mm -hmm. uh, is that there are 56 million people with disabilities in the United States now mm -hmm. and it's going up as the population as the baby boomers hit the uh, the Enjoy numbers the AARP set. yeah exactly mm -hmm. it's 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 one of the biggest most not recognized uh, political power out there mm -hmm. and if they if that sleeping giant becomes energized, it can, it can uh, ho hopefully move mountains. But it, it's, it's getting it organized and getting people to work together. Different disability groups can't be fighting over their little bit of the pie. And once I get my little bit, it's all right, I'm all right. The others have to fight for the, now we all have to, we all have to move together and uh, work as a, as a larger force for the good. And even when it doesn't affect us, when it's not something that I need or my kids need, but you still know it's for the bigger good of all of those who do need it. Yeah, that's the thing I think that, uh, that I feel very strongly is when, you, when, when Nick got in, there was a lot of chatter like, well, his parents are connected or his, you know, the, or my last name, Astor, like, oh, he's an Astor. I said, no. But the, what I had, which a lot of people don't, and what you have, is that we fight. We're willing to stand up. We're not ashamed. We don't hide. We don't sit down and say, I guess we can't do it. I don't know if it's where it comes from in you. I, it just when, my, when Nick said to me, I want to live away at college, I was like, this is going to be really complicated. But I love you, and you're right. You should go away to college. And it was really complicated. But it was worth it. And, but I don't want it to always have to be so complicated because it takes a big toll. That moment came for me when my kids were six and they went away for, to camp mm -hmm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how are they going to live without <laughs> me? <laughs> it's a common, yeah. It's Particularly common Alba. Yeah. And it was, it was, and they were so excited to go and do what everyone, all the other kids were going to camp and so on and so forth. And I stood at that bus and I put them on the bus and as tears streaming down my face as the bus pulled away. And it was only, they went for three weeks and it was only in the second week that I allowed myself to relax. And then they were coming back. There's a, have you seen that show Speechless? Yes, yes. Can you remind me of the mother a little bit? You have that, that fight and the, the British accent. Oh. So, <laughs> but 
But she also, the mother in that show also reminds me of myself. You know, yes. It's that thing. And, but they have these really good little moments. Um, like when the kid goes away with his uh, personal care attendant for the first time and they don't know what to do. The family's sitting there going, now what? Because it's such a, you know, I, when Nick went to college, I was like, oh. What now? Yeah. <laughs> so I was... I, before I got married, I lived in Spain, mm -hmm. and I speak Spanish. And I used to take the kids down in the summer to stay at my mother's house down in Spain. And a friend of my husband's uh, was very well known radio. Radio is very, very big in Spain. Mm -hmm. Everybody listens to the radio. And uh, he, uh, the radio company and television company that he worked for were one of the biggest supporters of uh, the biggest disability organization in Spain. So they had this program called Sin Barreras, Without Barriers. And they would ask me every year to go on the radio and talk to Spaniards. And the day I was scheduled that particular day to speak on the radio, I said to my husband, I said, I gotta, I'm going to the fish market. And I said, I'm going to take Anastasia with me. You take care of Alba. I threw Anastasia in the back of the car with her uh, fold-up wheelchair. And when we get to the market, there were stairs, like the Roman stairs, like going, like, I mean, ragged stairs. And so I see this tall fellow coming along, and I stopped him, and I said, would you mind helping me with the wheelchair up mm -hmm. the stairs? And he looked at me and he looked at Anastasia and he says, oh, to Anastasia, he says, you're such a pretty little girl. What is your name? How old are you? And I looked at him and I said, you have a child with a disability, don't you? And he said, how do you know? And I said, because you spoke to her. You didn't ask me how old she was and tell me the compliment. You spoke directly to her. And he says, yes, I do. And then he told me he, about his child. And I said, oh, I said, how, how is she doing? And he says, well, my wife is having a very hard time. And my son, who is not disabled, is also having a hard time. And I said, he said, do you have other children? And I said, yes, I do. I said, as a matter of fact, Anastasia is an identical twin, her twin, twin I have four children, but her twin is also severely disabled. And he immediately crossed himself. Mm -hmm. And he says, in Spanish, all in Spanish, he said, what a cross you have to carry. And I said, no. I said, I don't have to carry a cross. I said, but I said, does your wife have listened to the radio? Do you know the programmer called Sin Barreras? Mm -hmm. And he says, yes, of course. And I says, well, I'll be talking at six o'clock on that program tonight, I want you to get your wife and your son to listen. Mm -hmm. And I said, my name is Mary. His name was Jose. Mm -hmm. And so he helps me up the stairs. And the f I wanted Anastasia to go to the fish market because everybody's yelling, oh, the shrimp are good today, and mm -hmm. this is this, mm -hmm. and it's very colorful and all the smells, and it's in, in the old part of town, and there's a lot yeah, of, yeah. It, I wanted to, to have that experience. So the show comes on that night, and I, uh, uh, we're talking about different aspects of disability, and I started talking about how, how important it was to take your child to the beach, to take them to restaurants, to take them wherever you go with your family. Mm -hmm. Don't leave your child at home. Take your child with them. Don't be ashamed mm -hmm. of your child because if you are ashamed of your child, what do you expect them to feel? Other people yeah. to feel. Yeah. And I said, you know, I said, I take my kids everywhere. And I said, you know what? People come up to me and they say, I have a sister, I have a cousin. I have an aunt. And they talk because they're so pleased that someone is going to a restaurant and sitting there with their disabled child who's drooling and has to have a, a, and is just part of a normal family. 
And I say, I said, I had a very funny experience today. And then I said, Don Jose, and everyone in Spain is called Jose. Mm -hmm. So it didn't identify him. I said, Don Jose, I said, I hope you're listening. Mm -hmm. And I explained, you know, uh, about our meeting and everything. And I said, Don Jose said to me that I had a cross to bear uh, because I have two t uh, twins. Mm -hmm. And I told him that I did not have a cross to bear. And now I'll tell you why, as well as anyone else who's listening. I said, a cross to bear is when you bring your child up and at 16, they drink too much and they go out in a car and they kill themselves and other people, or they're killed by a drunk driver. I said, that is a cross to bear. I said, having a child with a disability is a new experience and you learn. And yes, I'd prefer that my kids were not disabled, but they are, mm -hmm. and so what? We have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's a bit harder, but a lot of things in so life. So you play the hand you're dealt. Yes. Yeah. And, and so that was my anecdote mm -hmm. about being ashamed and not being ashamed and just, for example, in advocacy, I'm not ashamed to call out a senator and mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. him and introduce myself. You have to be that, that, that little bit, if you will, out there. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. And because you, you, you're the example to show other people who do have a cousin or a child, and they're not doing that. Yeah. It's, and I, I've seen a lot of cultural barriers to that. A lot of people don't understand that if you don't fight, you get forgotten. And they think that, you know, well, we'll just see what comes and don't make trouble. And I'm like, trouble is my middle name. You know. When I was fighting my fight in the school fight, afterwards I would help and advocate with parents and try and mm -hmm. go to IEPs, particularly with those who didn't speak English because I knew how hard that oh, was. No, yeah. And I speak several languages, so I, I help they families help in, 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 in that way. And one of the things is, oh, no, 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 I, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to rock the boat. They, they will might take it out on my kid at school. And I said, listen here. I said, you rock that boat and you be the mother from hell <laughs> and you be the loudest voice because they will fear you and they won't dare touch your child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they won't dare do anything because the mother from hell is hovering. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's better that they fear you than that you fear them. And that's my advice to any parent now who's fighting for anything. Don't be scared of rocking the boat. Yeah. Okay, this has been Ability Fierce. Our guest today was Mary Somoza. Very good talk, lots of good stories, lots of, lots of uh, really good stuff for me. I hope it was good for you too. Like I said, this is just a loose discussion of disability issues. And if you want to come on, come reach out to us. Look at our website, www.abilityfierce.com and uh, help us with this uh, abilities revolution.